the uh, <clears throat> text is Romans chapter 6, the verses listed. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that the, our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. Baptism, obviously, today. <clears throat> Somebody tell me what the word, don't tell me what's involved in baptism, don't give me the four parts of Luther's explanation of baptism, I just want to know what the word means. Wash, yeah. It's a nice Greek word, that means apply water in some fashion, wash. <clears throat> the words used once in the verses before us today. So now here comes the experiment. Uh, didn't want that one, must want the next one. We'll get there. Oh, I had the wrong arrow. There we go. In the text, that's where the word is used. Baptized into. Okay, so think flood. Flood happens, you get caught in a flood, you get washed into this big ditch. So what's your relationship with the water? You're in the ditch. The water puts you there. The ditch is pretty full of water. What's your relationship with the water? This is going to be a long morning. <laughs> yeah, you're surrounded by the water. You're intimately connected with the water, right? Okay. Next phrase. That St. Paul says similar is... Buried with. Okay, now this time you've got to think mudslide. You get caught in a mudslide. What's your relationship to the mud? I said it before, this is repetition time. Surrounded by the mud, intimately connected with the mud. Right? Okay, so now in the text, Paul connects... Jesus, with those two phrases, and that's this, baptized into Christ Jesus and buried with Jesus. So what does that mean? Thank you. And intimately connected with Jesus. Now I'm not making this up. Paul tells us that that's what he means. In verse 5, where he says, we've been united with Jesus. Now, I'm not going to put this up on the screen, but what's the tool that Paul references in this part of the Scripture that says, through this tool God connects us with, makes us intimately united with Jesus? The tool is baptism. Thank you. So what sense does that make? How can washing with water connect us with Jesus? Well, the answer is, this isn't just washing with water. 
This is water used by Christ's command. So let's all read Christ's command together. Go and make disciples of all nations, washing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I did a little editing on that just to help you with remembering what baptism means. All right? So it's not just an ordinary washing. It's a washing by Christ's command. It's a washing that St. Peter at Pentecost says accomplishes something. He says this. What's Peter say is granted through baptism? It's to get, let's read it together. For the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same Peter drew a conclusion from that in his first letter and says another blessing happens. And that blessing is wash your waist. Well, that actually it got skipped. Uh, the next one was Peter says it saves. This is St. Paul telling us another blessing of this special washing is to wash away sins. Now back to the verses before us today. Let's read the part together. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. have been united with him in his death. It comes a little bit later. Um, in, in the text. So the, sec the last line explains what he means with whole, this whole picture of being baptized into Christ and, and buried with Christ. It means we've been united with him in his death. So we were connected with Jesus. So death, <clears throat> Jesus' death is one of the two most important events that happened in the history of our world. Right? Jesus goes to the cross, but when he goes to the cross, he has all of our sins on himself. He sheds his blood, and his blood washes all of those sins of all of us and of the entire world away. In addition to that, Jesus on the cross experiences the punishment that God had mandated for sin. He dies, punishment mandated by God against anyone who sins. He also experiences hell, separation from God, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Another one of the, the punishments that God has mandated against anybody who sins. Of course, the issue is Jesus had never sinned. So what doesn't he deserve? Punishment. Yeah. So the only reason he gets those punishments mandated against sin is because he was wearing our sins. Yeah. So now back to the words that I have up there already. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We just talked about that. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, Jesus' death. We have been united with him in his death. So what does that mean? It means when Jesus died, we died right along him, right? Okay, so if his death accomplishes forgiveness of sins, if we're connected with him when he dies, the forgiveness of sins gets put on the people connected with him. That's what St. Paul is saying there. When Jesus suffered death as punishment for sin, we suffered as punishment for sin right along with him. When Jesus suffered separation from God as punishment for sin, we suffered punishment, separation from God, right along with Jesus. Which means, since we've already been punished for our sins, as we look to the future, we are no longer threatened by that punishment because we already experienced it connected with Jesus, connected with Jesus because of our baptism, according to St. Paul in the text. So our baptism connects us with Jesus. Jesus connected himself with the whole human race when he was born as a real human being. He had to be a real human being in order to be our Savior. One of the things the Savior was supposed to do was to do everything that God told human beings to do. God wants human beings to be baptized. That's what Jesus command. Jesus was doing everything that God wants human beings to do. 
<clears throat> Jesus wasn't baptized because he needed to be connected with the Savior. Why not? He is the Savior. He was baptized, connected with us, to do what God wants us to do. Now, I'm not making that one up either. That's what Jesus said when he was baptized. He was doing this because God had mandated that it was the right thing to do for everybody, and that's these words from Jesus from the Gospel lesson. Jesus did it, let's read it, to fulfill all righteousness. I said before that there were two most important things, events in the history of the world. One was Jesus' death, the other one was Jesus' resurrection. So he goes to the cross, he experiences hell on the cross, he experiences death on the cross, he gets buried, he becomes alive again, he declares his victory over Satan, and then he shows himself alive so that everybody gets it, that he rose from the dead. Uh, St. Paul in the verses before us today also references Jesus' resurrection. Let's read it. Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. Okay, the Father deserves our glory. Why? Well, because of everything he's done for us, primary of which is planned our salvation. The resurrection is the complete fulfillment of God's plan for our salvation, so we give the Father glory also because of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, Paul's reference to the resurrection, he also does something with that. Let's read it. We are united with Jesus in his resurrection. So again, Jesus rose from the dead. Paul's saying, we get connected with him. And what's the tool Paul referenced that, that connects us with Jesus in both his death and his resurrection? Baptism. Right. So what does Jesus' resurrection accomplish? Well, it accomplishes a whole bunch of things. The Savior had to be God. The resurrection proves Jesus is God. That means he's worth enough as a ransom payment to wash away the sins of the world. It also means he's capable of taking the righteousness that he lived as a perfect human being, a human being just as we are, but he's God and he can take that righteousness and put it on the whole human race. It also means, the resurrection means, that Jesus always speaks the truth. He said he was going to rise from the dead, he did it. So we can be confident that anything else he says is probably true too. The resurrection also proves that our sins are forgiven. Jesus said he was going to accomplish forgiveness by dying on a cross and shedding his blood. So what do you think God would have meant if he'd have left Jesus dead? Would our sins be forgiven? No. Jesus, God would have said his sacrifice wasn't enough, sins are forgiven, none of this worked. Well, that didn't work that way. Jesus rose from the dead, which means our sins are forgiven. The resurrection also proves that we're going to rise from the dead. Jesus promised we're going to rise from the dead. If he couldn't raise himself, could he raise us? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead himself, could he raise us? No, thank you. No, but he rose, which means he can keep his promise to raise us as well and live with him forever. Now, you might think that that new life to which we will be raised and live in perfection with God forever is the new life that Paul's talking about in this section from Romans. But it's not. So let's look at it and see why I said it's not. Whoop. Uh, let's see. It's supposed to be verse 4. Okay, so let's go to verse... Look uh, verse 4. Uh, let me see here. I don't have it. So I'll read it. It's in your worship folders. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That's the part I was uh, triggering off. We, we may live a new life. So now is that new life refer to the resurrection after Judgment Day. Um, look at uh, this section now. So follow along, I'll read it, it's rather long. For if we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self 
was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law but under grace. So this new life he's talking about is not eternal life with God after we die or after judgment day. What new life is he talking about? That whole section that I just read. What's he talking about there? The new life of our godliness and holiness and righteousness that we're living now on this earth. He says that from the opposite direction in the first two verses of this chapter when he says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live it any longer? So he's saying we're resurrected with Christ then it leads to the new life of godliness, holiness, and righteousness that Christians ought to be living, reflecting the holiness of Jesus. So Jesus connected himself with us when he was born. He became a, hu a real human being in order to be a savior. He couldn't be a, the savior if he weren't a human being. He was baptized, I said before, as part of his doing everything God said human beings were supposed to do. And he was doing it as our replacement. But we're connected with him through his baptism, which means our connection with him gives us the power, the ability, and the motive to live our life how? How can Christians live our lives with the power and ability and motive that comes from Jesus? How do we live our lives? Don't we live godly lives, I hope? Righteous, godly? Why can we do that? We can do that because we're connected with Jesus through baptism. We can do all of these things because of our connection with Jesus through baptism. I just picked out phrases from the text, so, so let's read them one at a time. We are able to crucify the old self, do away with the body ruled by sin, not be slaves to sin, not let sin rule, not obey evil desires, not offer ourselves as instruments of wickedness, offer ourselves as instruments of righteousness, not have sin as our master, and not live in sin any longer. We couldn't do any of that on our own. The only way we can strive to do that and actually do it is because we're connected with Jesus. Let's pray the prayer at the end of the... Oh, that's up there too. Let's pray the prayer, and at the end of a prayer, we have this nice Hebrew word that says... We believe this is going to happen. We believe it's all true. Right on. You can add that nice Hebrew word at the end. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for connecting me through baptism into your death and into a new life. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.